Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. The Chief Minister is engaged in all the duties this afternoon, so he has asked me to lead today's briefing. I'm pleased to be joined at the podium by the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, Dr Alex Allenson, and our Director of Public Health, Dr, Dr Henrietta Hewitt. On Monday, the island took another step in our journey back to normality, with the further easing of our border restrictions. For the first time since March last year, non-residents without a connection to the island are able to visit the Isle of Man through the no test and no isolation pathway. Restrictions remain in place, but this latest easing of our border restrictions and the new pathway means that people who meet three criteria are eligible to apply for an exemption to visit the island on the grounds of being fully vaccinated. This means they will not need to isolate or have a test when they arrive. Firstly, you must be travelling to the island from the common travel area. That's the UK, Ireland and the Channel Islands. Secondly, you must be fully vaccinated meaning you have had two doses of an approved vaccine that was administered within the common travel area. Thirdly, two weeks must have passed since your second dose by the time you arrive on Ireland. Since the new regulations came into effect on Monday, there have been more than 4,500 applications. That number will only increase over the coming days and weeks. Just over 600 people arrived on the island on Monday, when the vaccination exemption came into effect, followed by 358 on Tuesday and 552 yesterday. More than 1,000 people are expected to arrive today ahead of the bank holiday weekend. I understand the process at both our sea and airports is working well. Officers on duty to assist travellers who may not have their paperwork fully in order are doing a great job in keeping people moving. The travel notification service is seeing increased demand in terms of phone calls and emails and anyone wishing to make an inquiry is being encouraged to read the information and conditions which are online before making contact. This is available at both gov.im forward slash COVID-19 and visitisleofman.com and covers everything that you need to know. This is a new system and these applications take time to process. Given the numbers, we are aiming for an average turnaround time of 48 hours. The uptake is welcome and encouraging, but it's important that everyone understands the team is working hard to get through the applications as swiftly as possible. Please do be patient. We'll look at the vaccination programme shortly, but first let's hand over to our Director of Public Health, Dr Henrietta Hewitt, for an update. Dr. Thank Hewitt. you, uh, Minister Ashford. Yes, the um, border changes are obviously good news for travelling, but they do come with a risk of importing cases, and we can't get away from that. We will see imported cases. We already are seeing imported cases. People who have been fully vaccinated, that's the two plus two, do have a considerable degree of protection against becoming infected and therefore risking transmission to others. And they have even higher levels of protection against becoming ill with COVID um, or needing hospitalisation. So vaccination does offer a significant degree of protection against infection and spread, but it doesn't eliminate that risk. And it's important that we remember that. In addition to that, we also have the pathway for those who are eligible, um, residents and others in the specified groups, to come onto the island without being fully vaccinated, and they can opt for the test and release pathway. The test and release pathway, which involves having a test on day one and being released on receipt of a negative, uh, being free to largely go about your business apart from attending health and care settings and then having a surveillance test at day six, that does not guarantee that people are not going to come on the island incubating infection and indeed having had the opportunity to spread it for a couple of days before they're picked up on a day six surveillance test. So we have to accept that the risk of COVID moving around in our community is there with us. Vaccination gives a high degree of protection and as the vaccination programme rolls out, that creates an ever bigger and stronger firewall against COVID. But there is still a risk. There's a risk for those people who have not yet been vaccinated or have only been partially vaccinated. And uh, there is a risk, of course, for people who are not getting a 100% protection 
from the vaccination. And that, of course, is very difficult to identify. We don't really know which of us those people will be. So the message there is that we do have to continue to be careful and to take responsibility. So that's thinking about hands, face, space, fresh air. It's thinking about, are we comfortable going into a crowded setting or would we rather not? Would we want to limit our attendance at gatherings to those that are outdoor rather than those that are in crowded indoor spaces? So it's very much about thinking about our own responsibility and about how what we've been doing, if we have recently come back onto the island, might impact on others and how we might want to think about our behaviour in, in those terms. OK, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Dr. Yu. It's some very important messages there, particularly around ventilation and ensuring that where we are indoors, the spaces that we are in for periods of time are well ventilated. I must emphasise that people must stay at home if they have symptoms of COVID and also call 111. And that includes while waiting for tests and results and also applies even if you are fully vaccinated. This also applies to people on the no isolation and no test pathway. Test and isolation is waived at the border, but it still applies if someone develops symptoms. In line with the changes to the borders that came into effect on Monday, Manx Care are reminding all travellers, residents and non-residents who arrive in the island on any of the pathways, they must not attend health and care settings for the first 10 days after their arrival unless for emergency medical care or by prior authorisation. This applies to all Manx care facilities, including care homes, GP practices, hospitals and residential homes. However, there is an important caveat to that 10-day restriction on visiting health and care settings for those who have vaccination appointments. Returning residents who have had a first or second COVID-19 vaccination booked within the first 10 days of their arrival can now attend their appointment so long as they follow the correct guidance depending on their travel pathway. Those who enter the island from travel within the common travel area, so just to remind us again, that's the UK, Jersey, Guernsey or Ireland, on the test to release pathway will be permi permitted to enter a vaccination hub after a negative code of test within 48 hours of their arrival. They should call 111 first in order to arrange formal permission to attend the vaccination hub. Those who enter the island having travelled from outside the common travel area on the seven-day pathway must first receive a negative COVID test within 48 hours of arrival and then a subsequent negative test on day six. After this, they should call 111 in order to arrange formal permission to attend the vaccination hub. Please, if you are on that pathway, come to the vaccination hub unaccompanied or if you need someone with you, that should be someone who has not arrived on Ireland within the last 10 days. And face coverings must be worn when entering and throughout the period you are within the vaccination hub. We hope this will make it easier for residents who have to go away and are not having to worry about their appointment being in the first 10 days of their return. This will also help the booking team and reduce any waste of vaccine. It is important to emphasise that people entering the island must follow the direction notice they are issued and follow the rules. I am also hearing reports that people who are booked in to receive their COVID tests through the pathways are turning up to the test centre early. In some cases, two or three hours before their appointments, which is causing massive delays. This is due, I believe, to people believing that if they get tested earlier, they may get their results earlier and in the case of test to release, be released earlier. However, this is not the case, as results are sent off in large batches, normally around 400, and so turning up early does not mean you will get your results any quicker. The 111 team have booked people in for their appointments accordingly, so please only turn up at your booked slot, as otherwise it simply causes delay and disruption for others. It is important to remember that although results are generally returned within 24 hours, it can take up to 48 hours for results to be returned, so please don't chase 111 within that time frame for your result. 
I'm now going to hand over to Minister Allenson for an update on the current COVID-19 cases in schools and the mitigations that have been put in place. Over to you, Alex. Thank you, David. This time in the school year, staff and students are normally very busy. For sixth formers, they're looking back on what they've learnt and are finishing assessments and exams. For younger pupils, they're looking forward to moving up to secondary school or sixth form. Due to the pandemic, all students have been affected to some degree. I'd like to thank our teachers and students for their dedication, hard work and patience as they navigated systems created by the various award bodies to allocate central assessed grades. This process is now largely completed and I wish all our students at school and UCM the best of luck in getting the grades that they deserve. Transition visits for primary school pupils have been going ahead to prepare them for the next stage in their education and familiarising them with the new schools come September. This is an exciting time, although some may be nervous about moving to big school. On Sunday, it was confirmed that a member of staff at St Ninian School had tested positive for COVID-19. I'd really like to thank them and all their colleagues for the calm and professional way they handled this situation. All visits to and from St Ninian's to other educational facilities have been suspended for this week, but these will be, be reviewed. Unfortunately, this has meant that some transition visits have had to be rescheduled. It also meant that the teams from St Ninian's invited to the Junior Achievement Company of the Year Awards ceremony held at the nunnery this week were unable to attend, but watched the event virtually. Against strong competition, the teams won the award for Best Use of Marketing and were also named Student Company of the Year. They'll be presented with their prizes and a cheque for £1,000 at an event later this month. Now, these temporary restrictions are just precautions and will re be reviewed by the department next week. I know that parents have been concerned at the risk of spread of COVID-19 and have also been taking up the offer of lateral flow tests for their children. So far, a total of four children across two schools have tested positive and contact tracing together with further testing is ongoing. This contact tracing is now far more focused on friendship groups and high-risk contacts. We want to protect the safety of all our pupils and staff without severely disrupting the education service. Mitigations include the extra supply of lateral flow tests to secondary schools and for home use. Students and staff are able to wear face coverings, should they wish, which are available at school free of charge for those who don't, who don't have their own. Increased messaging on the importance of hands, face, space and fresh air, reduced indoor activities and increased ventilation of rooms is also in place. But parents and students are asked to re remain vigilant for the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and stay at home and call 111 if any of these should develop. That needs to be the take-home message for all of us. The last 14 months have allowed us to develop a highly successful vaccination programme, a robust track and trace system, and a more resilient health service. But as we start to get used to living in a world with COVID, we also need to look after our own health and help others close to us to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. It is clear that we do have some transmission of the virus in the community. Therefore, it is important that we all do our part and monitor any symptoms that could be related to COVID-19. This also applies to those who are visiting the island under the no test and isolation pathway. Anyone who develops any sort of symptom is asked to isolate and call 111. Remember, don't guess, get a test. But as we have always been clear, it was when, not if, the virus would return. We must now adapt to live with the virus as part of our lives. This means being less concerned with case numbers. Our vaccination programme is breaking the link between having the virus and being seriously ill with it. On that note, turning to our vaccination programme, the island's vaccination rollout is continuing at pace and last week saw the programme administering its 100,000th vaccine into the arms of James Redmond. A huge milestone that is down to the incredibly hard-working teams that have been involved. This afternoon, we have completed 63,241 first-dose vaccines and 43,625 second-dose vaccines, 
meaning we have now vaccinated 87% of the adult population and 60% have received their second dose. Having more than half of the adult population vaccinated with the full course is a huge achievement, helping to prevent people becoming seriously ill with the virus or needing hospital care. More widely, this level of immunity adds to our community's defence against the Delta variant, which is extremely important. I would urge all residents who are awaiting their second dose to please attend their appointment. Both doses are needed for full protection against the virus. Additionally, Public Health England studies have shown that two doses of the vaccine are highly effective against hospitalisation from the Delta variant. Having it makes sense. Our rollout has gone very well so far, but I must emphasise the importance of attending your second appointment. I am aware that some individuals may be concerned that they will experience side effects after both the first and second dose. But people should not worry, as these are usually relatively minor, and in most cases are much less severe than suffering from COVID-19 itself, and the risk of potential long-term health implications from having the virus. We are nearing the end of this stage of the vaccination programme, and therefore I encourage those who are yet to register for the vaccine to please come forward. The vaccination is our way out of the pandemic, and the best way to protect yourself, your family, and the wider community. The vaccination teams are working extremely hard to book all residents in to receive their jab, so it is vital that you attend your appointment at the right time and date. If you can't make an appointment, please ring 111 to let the team know. Please don't be a no-show, as this results in vaccine being wasted. Those who miss appointments risk their first dose being delayed and being moved to the back of the programme. This Sunday we'll see the closure of the airport hub as we head towards the end of the current vaccination programme. In line with the border changes, the airport is already starting to see an increase in traffic, so plans are in place to close this hub as the airport returns to its primary function. Since it opened on the 28th of January, nearly 30,000 vaccines have been administered at the airport, which is a credit to the incredible and hard-working team who have worked at weekends to get jabs into the arms of our community. Individuals who were originally booked in to receive their jab at the airport on Saturday the 10th and Sunday the 11th of July, and also the following weekend, Saturday the 17th and Sunday the 18th of July, are reminded that their appointment will now take place at Chester Street in Douglas. All appointments will be on the same day and the same time, just in the new location. Many of you would have seen the announcement from the UK JCVI last night in regards to the COVID vaccination booster programme. The Isle of Man's programme will follow the guidance of the JCVI. However, this is only interim advice currently, and so more will be announced when we receive further information. Finally, before turning to questions from the media, I would like to talk about the NHS app. I believe there has been some confusion around the use of the NHS app. This partnership with the UK NHS for the COVID vaccination certification is designed to be used by Isle of Man residents for overseas travel as it will be internationally recognised. Currently work is still ongoing to arrange for the app ability to be switched on for Isle of Man residents and we are optimistic this will be done shortly. However, it is important to note that this will not hinder anyone's ability to apply for their vaccination exemption should they wish to travel back to the Isle of Man. There are various ways people can prove their status, including the vaccine record card given to you when you had your vaccinations. There is plenty of information on this on the Government COVID website under Travel on Borders. It is important that individuals do not contact their GP for a vaccination letter at this time as they will not be able to provide one. The official vaccination status certification is being provided through the UK NHRS app or hard copy vaccination certificate 
This is not yet available until the app goes live, but much work is going on to have our patient data transferred so that it will appear on the app. And then if people require a hard copy letter with the security tag letters, then they can do so. We are getting reports of GP phone lines being clogged with people constantly ringing to ask for a letter or about the app, meaning patients who are ill aren't able to get through for medical reasons. And we'll now turn to questions from the media. And first up, I've got Paul Moulton of Alaman Television. Good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon. I'd like to turn to the question of symptoms. It was some months ago we discussed uh, headaches and how people were not having that on the list of the, the reason, reason to get a test. Um, obviously, you've seen um, that now that many countries are putting headaches on because of the Delta variant. Where are we up to? Because are, we, are we still slavishly following, following UK guidelines slash European guidelines? Because if, even uh, on UK commercial radio, the U UK government is actually stating headaches as an item that you should be concerned about and go for a test. Yeah. I'll bring the Director of Public Health in, if I may, in a moment to um, answer that in more, in more thoroughly than I can. But my understanding is we still follow the ECDC, gui um, ECDC guidance. Um, in relation to symptoms, Paul, I mean, if you look across health authorities across the world, there is an absolute plethora of symptoms um, that are recorded. Um, I did a quick search after the last time, actually, we spoke about this at a press conference. And I think before I gave up, I'd come up with about 100 different symptoms that are listed across the world, across various health authorities authorities so it, it, it's a combination so what we've tended to go for is the major symptoms as listed by ECDC but I'll go over to Henrietta Thank you, Minister. That, that's absolutely right. Uh, the variation between countries and even between studies is huge. Um, you'll know that the ONS study, which I think is uh, where the source of the data that you're quoting at the minute, has actually flagged that headache and cough, I think, are the two highest um, prevalent symptoms. Um, if you look at the results that were published last week from the ZOE app-based study, which is not a formal paper, it's just um, originally it was um, a report on the BBC, then a YouTube clip from Tim Spector, who is the professor who's running it. There is now some data actually presented um, on the ZOE website, and that just ranks the symptoms that people reported on the app um, in conjunction with a positive test for COVID, and they've then split that down by vaccination status. So that shows that if you've got two plus two, you've completed your vaccinations and you get infected, which we know a percentage of people will still go on to get infected despite vaccination, then you are more likely to have very non-specific symptoms like runny nose, um, sneezing, um, in addition to the the others like headache, cough and so on. The issue that you then get into is did those people actually have symptoms that had been caused by their COVID or did they have asymptomatic COVID which you'd expect to see much more in the vaccinated and therefore the symptoms were just um, um, casually related rather than causally and could have been hay fever or something random. And the issue with headaches, of course, is headache is such a non-specific symptom, and so many of us have a headache at some point, and we have no data that actually allows us to see what the positive predictive value of headache is in terms of the conversion rate of people who have headache and actually go on to test positive for COVID. So it is very difficult. We do keep all of this under review with the... Um, COVID strategy testing group, which is largely public health and laboratory colleagues, but we also have regular review with our 111 clinical colleagues, and we take all this through the clinical and public health group to get the wider view on it. And it's, it's quite a difficult call because, yes, on one hand, we want to keep testing to find cases. That was the case. Actually, as we move forward into living with COVID, do we actually want to go on doing that? Do we want to chase down cases to the nth degree or do we not? And I think that's going to become clearer as we get to the point of having rolled out the vaccination programme. And we are in a kind of interim period for the next two months while we're sort of balancing 
the old scenarios and the residual risk that we do have in our population for transmission of COVID, while we still have a significant number of people who are not fully protected by vaccination. But once we get to the end of August and into September and we have that much stronger firewall, then actually we're probably not going to be so into counting cases. Um, and in terms of actually surveillance, there is a a call to be taken on, is it better to try and encourage people to come forward for surveillance by saying, more or less, any symptom you're concerned about, come and have a COVID test? Or is it better to say, actually, we won't do that, we'll leave the PCR testing to try and focus on the people who are most likely to have significant infection, which is not only more of a risk for them, but also more of a risk for transmission, and keep the grandstand service with capacity for them, but have other means of doing the surveillance around how much is this just out in the community. And at the moment, that might be about LFDs, quite soon and by late summer autumn I think it's going to be around the wastewater testing because we have plans for that underway so I think that's where we are at the moment thank you so just to be clear if someone's got a headache or sniffles or whatever are you suggesting they shouldn't worry about it or should they self-isolate and, and follow what the UK government is saying on their, these radio ads that, so you should actually you know keep away from other people even if you've got any sort of symptom whatsoever I think that gets us to the point where we are likely to end up locking down the island again by default, which is quite clearly not in line with the mitigation strategy. So I don't think I would say that. I mean, obviously, if you know you have fe hay fever and you have a runny nose and a sneeze, um, you know, the likelihood that that's positively predictive of your having COVID is very low. Um, if you've got a headache... You know, which of us hasn't had a headache over the last, say, six weeks? Um, I think there you look for, is it a persistent headache? Is it a headache that's different to how you would normally experience headache if you're someone who tends to get them? And if you've got a reason for concern, always ring 111 because then you can have the clinical assessment and be advised whether testing's appropriate. Yeah, Thank I you. mean, I mean for me, Paul, as a, as a layman... For me as a layman, because I'm by no means a clinician or public health expert in any way, shape or form, um, but for me as a layman, it's about exactly what Henry had to just mention there, which is about continuing symptoms. Mm -hmm. If you have symptoms that are continuing longer than normal, you feel worried about them, then come forward for testing. That's what I would base it upon, whereas if you've got a headache, um, you take a couple of paracetamol and it goes away. Um, I, you know, personally, I would say that's not quite as much of an issue, but if it's ongoing, then you should be coming forward. And I think that's the basis people need to take it on. But like I say, I'm just, I'm just a layman in this area. No, I think that's right. I think the key there is, is this something that's out of the ordinary for you? Right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Alex Allison, please. Um, I'll start this way, make your way to the podium. Um, hearing from many people about the situation where there's some school children that have been told to go home, isolate. Parents have been told to also isolate for 21 days. And these are parents who have had both jabs and they're plus two weeks. And they, they are, some of them, very annoyed because they thought this was to get past that situation. Mm -hmm. Am I reading this right? Is this still the policy? Exactly like that? Oh, yeah. well, well, thanks very much for giving me the, the opportunity to clarify this. Um, f first of all, children aren't being told by anyone to go home and self-isolate. As I said in, um, earlier, what we've done that's different this time is where we get a positive case in a school we're using a far more nuanced way of contact tracing. So the contact tracers will go in, they'll identify particularly the friendship groups and then ask them to self-isolate and get tested. Um, now, if they, if they turn out to be positive, obviously they're then um, treated differently. So far with the contact tracing we've done both for the member of staff and for the initial case at St Ninian's, all the other friendship groups were, were negative, which is quite quite re reassuring in some ways in terms of spread. So we haven't sent entire classes home, we haven't sent entire year groups home. And those, those that have been identified as high-risk people are asked to self-isolate for 10 days and will have follow-up testing. Now, I'd also like to, to take on board your comments about those who've been fully vaccinated. Um, we have had a change in, in policy in terms of those people who are fully vaccinated, they will be obviously assessed by the track and trace system if they are in a household with somebody who's been identified with, as high risk because they've been 
fully vaccinated, they will not be expected to self-isolate. So what we're trying to do is concentrate on those people who may be at a risk of having the infection or have already got been identified of having the infection without disrupting all the rest of their households and the rest of the school environment. So this, this is a change. We are developing this because obviously, um, as, the, as Minister Ashford has said, we don't want to have end up with lockdown by default. We're very aware of some of the situations in the United Kingdom whereby a large proportion, hundreds of thousands of, of school children are being kept out of school because they may or may not have been at risk. And so we're really trying to target this on those people who are most at risk and dealing with them very much on an individual basis rather than some blanket ban about coming into school. And can you clarify, people can't keep their children off school because I've got another letter here saying that uh, they've been penalised, that it'll be counted as a strike, that they didn't okay. send their children to school this morning because they were worried about any yeah. uh, bringing home the, the virus. Is that yeah. the situation, that policy at the minute? You can't keep your children off school? Okay. And, and again, th th thank you for le letting me clarify this because the, the, we're, we're out of the state of emergency, so normal laws do apply, and our Education Act says you know, you have a responsibility to send your child into school. I completely understand the, the nervousness at, uh, at the moment about um, children in schools and the risk of infection. I mean, we have to remember the, um, the proportion of children who get seriously unwell is incredibly low. The statistics show from the UK over last year that the chance of, of somebody under the age of 18 developing coronavirus and dying was around about one in a million. This is a very low risk group, but I understand the concern from parents, particularly if their child has got some medical vulnerabilities, or they have as well. If a parent decides that they are, they're really concerned, they don't want to send their child into school, please discuss that with your head teacher. Yes, they will be marked as absent. You're quite right. However, we as a department are not going to pursue you. We're not going to, to threaten to take you to court. We want to work with you to build up that confidence. Um, but please have a chat with your head teacher, discuss your, your concerns, and we can work together for that. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on with you and Gorn from Manx Radio. Faster, my um, first question is for the Education Minister, um, if I may. Uh, now, when Manx Radio received the news about uh, Cronkerberry Primary School yesterday, um, we didn't actually know it was Cronkerberry Primary School yep. because we received a message um, uh, not going to be told what, where the school was as we move to mitigation and we try not to alarm people too much. Now, if you're asking people to make informed personal choices, surely you need to keep them informed. Absolutely, you and I, and I mean, first of all, I'd just like to thank the media for everything you've done over the last 15 months in terms of that communication, because there are some people who don't read press briefings, there's some people who don't read the newspaper, but they do listen to the radio, or they look at things online. What we had the situation um, with the, 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 the one case in a primary school was we wanted to make sure that that school community were the first people to know, that they were contacted by the head teacher, that they were um, counselled properly by Track and Trace before we released it to the general population. I think also we have to get away from a situation where every time there is one case, wherever it may be, whether it's in a bar or a school or in fact the hospital, uh, suddenly a press release goes out. We are trying to deal with this in a different way. We're making sure that those people who really need to know are the ones that find out first. And then more... that goes against yeah. informing people and allowing them to make those choices. If they well, hear first that there's a primary school and they don't know which one yeah. it is, surely that's more alarming than knowing which one it is. Well, well, no, I mean, to put this in perspective, you and we've got 6,300 primary school kids. We had one who tested positive. So, you know, the, the first priority um, for, for me and for the department is to make sure that head teacher knows, make sure those school children within that class and those high risk kids know and that school community knows. Then we're more than happy to share it with everyone else. But if we get the word out that one school has been affected before those, that before those people who really need to know know, um, that sends out the wrong message from my point of view because they, again, the track and trace team are working in a different way we're not going to close that school down we're not going to send that that class home we are dealing with it in an individual way now the other aspect of this is people saying right everyone at Cronkyberry must be infected therefore they shouldn't come to a club tonight they shouldn't go to a dance lesson again that's not what we what we're saying we're trying to make sure that those people who need to make that decision that the pupils and the families involved are the first people to know and they get the chance to make that the right decision for them and also they get the chance to discuss that with the head teacher or the track and trace team and we also have to remember you and as we move forward it's not about cases anymore so there will be cases in the community the likelihood is 
that we may have cases in the community forevermore now at some level. Um, we may never get to a point of zero cases again. So there will be circulation. There will be potentially circulation amongst children. What matters is the outcome of these cases. And so as we move, it is going to be a culture shift. And it is going to take people, including myself, quite a while to get used to it, where we won't be rushing out with press releases, listing all the venues, as we have done previously, where things may have occurred, where transmission may have occurred, because we will be dealing with things on an individualistic basis as and when they emerge. Thank you. Well, my second question is about lateral flow tests. Now, I understand that this is uh, probably for yourself, uh, Health Minister. I understand if you're travelling from the common travel area to Northern Ireland, you need to take, or we've been asked to take, a rapid lateral flow test before your journey. Uh, now, there's a flight to Belfast from the Isle of Man uh, tomorrow. We've had a few people getting in touch, actually quite concerned that they haven't been able to take one of these tests. They've spoken to 111. They can't access them. So, how do, you, how do you get access to a lateral flow test on the Isle of Man? They will need to arrange it privately, you and it's private travel at the end of the day. Government will, does not provide for private travel. We, ha we did put in place PCR testing for private travel for certain jurisdictions because people were finding it very hard to access that privately at a cost um, which was at £50. Um, but in relation to people's private travel arrangements, it is absolutely essential they understand what the requirements are for them to enter wherever they are travelling to. It will differ country to country what the requirements are, but it is up for people to arrange their own and facilitate their own testing pathways in line with where they need to travel to. Is it something government might consider making more widely available, these lateral flow tests, in the future, though? Um, well, I can never say never to anything, you because you never know which way things are going to go. Um, my crystal ball, as I keep saying, gets a bit more foggy every day. We don't know where things will be. But certainly at the moment, um, we are focused, obviously, on surveillance and mitigation on Ireland. If people are travelling privately, it is important that they can actually, um, they actually decide um, what they need to put in place to allow that travel to happen. But I'll bring the Director of Public Health in. Yes, I don't really have very much more to add to that. Obviously, the international travel arrangements change regularly from different countries. And as the Minister has said, it is really up to people who are making their own private travel arrangements to make sure that they're up to date with what's required and um, find out how they can comply with that. Thank you. OK, and we move on with Paul Hardman from Alaman Newspapers. Paul. Good afternoon. With the borders open and the risk of a future widespread outbreak, is there any threshold of infections at which the government would reimpose restrictions, be these masks or social distancing, and is another lockdown ruled out? So what it now comes down to is impact on the health services. It's easy to forget now, um, 15 months on, from where we started out. And the reason that we had the initial lockdown last year in March was we saw what was happening in countries such as Italy and also starting to develop in the UK as well, where health services were coming under pressure and in some countries were even physically collapsing. And it was put in place to try and bring down demand that would be there on health services. So as we move away from physical case numbers, it's about wellness. It's about how ill are people as a result. Now, we can see from what's happening in the UK and other countries that are very far ahead in their vaccination programmes that the vaccine is breaking that link between serious illness, death and the virus. So as we move forward, we move forward with more confidence. But the, the thing we will be monitoring is the numbers in hospital, and that will dictate what actions we go through going forward. Um, and it's, so that's what we, the focus will be. It will not be around physical case numbers and any set threshold in that terms. It will be around, is the health services able to cope? Are the health services going to be overwhelmed? And if we did, if and when we see another widespread outbreak, for example, one that begins in schools, is there not also a danger that this could lead to significant disruption from the large amount of key infrastructure workers who have to self-isolate, for example, police, fire and ambulance personnel? Well, the, well, with the vaccination programme, that changes the isolation profile because those who are vaccinated 2 plus 2 will not be isolated in that way. So most of our key infrastructure workers, I would suspect, will have 
decided to have taken up the vaccine. So, for instance, if they are contact traced, unless they themselves are the positive case, they will not have to isolate in that way. So as the vaccination increases towards the end of August with more people 2 plus 2, that changes the dynamic around self-isolation. And in fact, if, you, if we speak about the vaccination as well, again, in serious illness and death, I mean, if you actually look at the most recent set of data out of the UK, um, which is the 29th of June, so two days ago, there was 324,643 active cases in the UK, of which there was 1,720 in hospital, which is 0.53% of active cases. And the daily death rate of active cases is about 0.01%. And that compares to the 29th of January, where there was 1.9 million cases and 33,800 in hospital. So it's clear that the vaccination has started to shift things and it will shift things in terms of isolation as well. So we won't have that same event that we had in February where we have got tens of thousands of people potentially going to be self-isolated. Thank you. Okay, and next up I've got Sam from Jeff. Good afternoon, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. I wonder if we could just uh, turn to the issue of uh, travel. People are asking what happens, if they just get a clarification really on what happens with green zone countries. Obviously, people are taking the opportunity while they can to get a bit of, get out of the country and get some summer things, but they want to know what they can do in terms of when they get back to the UK and then returning to the island. So at the moment, Sam, if people are travelling outside the common travel area, then basically um, it is, then basically it is um, isolation upon return. So it is the seven-day isolation. So they have to undertake the day one test and the day six test. We haven't mirrored the UK's traffic light system in that way. That's not to say we won't in the future. This is yet another stage on the border reopening, and maybe we may go down that route. But certainly, as it currently stands, if people travel outside of the common travel area, then it's basically seven-day isolation with test on day one, test on day six upon return. And Henrietta, and also I should say that vaccination 2 plus 2 doesn't extend to those travellers either. And I'll pass over to the Director of Public Health. Yeah, I mean, I think this has... has Minister has just acknowledged is likely to be something that will change over time. Obviously, one of the interesting things that has happened recently is that the UK rates of infection have gone higher than those across most of Europe. However, there are signs that that may be changing again because Europe is now beginning to feel the effects of transmission of the Delta variant. And of course, much of Europe is behind the UK and indeed behind us in terms of rollout of vaccine. So going forward, it's a question of looking at all the things in the mix really, which is the levels of vaccination, uh, the levels of transmission of levels of infection in the countries of destination and, of course, the um, emergence of variants of concern, particularly any variant that looks as if it may be able to evade vaccine. Um, so it's a pretty inexact science at the moment, but as things progress and as vaccination rolls out, it will become clearer. But decisions will undoubtedly change over time with that. Thank you. And your second you. question, Sam? Uh, just staying with travel, it's another issue about, again, just people wanting clarification, really. Um, uh, one of our readers says about their parents are coming to the island and they just want to know what happens if someone on their flight who is not um, on this 2 plus 2 later test positive, are they contacted to inform them that somebody on their flight has test, uh, tested positive? And if so what then happens to them? Or is with this 2 plus 2, are they still free to go? So at the 2 plus 2 now, they wouldn't be required to isolate unless they themselves, of course, started to develop symptoms and then tested positive. Because if someone is actually positive, then they would have to isolate. But in terms of we wouldn't now in that way contact trace, they may well be informed that they've actually been on the flight. But then once it's established that they are 2 plus 2 vaccinated, they would be able to carry on as normal. Thank you. And then last up, I've got Leanne Cook from 3FM. Good afternoon, Leanne. Uh, good afternoon. My first question is for the Education Minister, please. Certainly. Um, given the recent coronavirus cases at schools, albeit a small number, um, we've had this question in, is there a point in which you consider closing schools, um, whether that be individually or collectively? And if so, what's the tipping point? 
And that's a very good question because as we've been talking about, we're, we're trying to do things differently. And, and the, the main thing, I suppose, is doing things that are proportionate um, and appropriate. If you get one child in a class testing positive and you test all their, their, their friends and really close contacts and they're all negative, then, then in the same way as you take these, the various layers off an onion, you're fairly confident that it hasn't necessarily spread any further. If, however, more of those children start testing positive, then you may want to isolate that particular class. Or you may want to, if it's a number of classes, you may want to isolate that particular year group. Now, we're trying to do this, as I said, in a proportionate way. But the tipping point would be to, if we had a large number of cases amongst a relatively small number of people, we may need to have a targeted intervention in terms of closing that class, year group, or even school down for maybe a week or two until we could make sure that things were, were, were safe for those children to then re-enter education. But that would very much be an individualised um, assessment based on the track and trace team, the numbers of cases, and also obviously um, based on it on, on clinical advice from the director of the public health. We are trying not to do this for, for two reasons. One, as I've, as, as I've said, the health implications for coronavirus amongst young people is relatively small. But more than that, we've seen the quite devastating effects of closing schools for long periods of time can have on children's education, but also their mental well-being, their mental health, and the health of their families, who often then lose out on childcare. So what we're doing is trying to resist the temptation to overreact, to react appropriately and proportionately, and manage each individual case on its own merits. So that's one of the things we'll, we'll be doing moving on as we do get individual cases dealing with those. However, we will share all that information with the people it affects. And if we reach a point whereby we need to take more further um, action, we will obviously explain that to the wider community so that they're aware of all the facts. Thank you. And my second question is for Minister Ashford. Um, this is a recurring question we've had from parents. They're wondering if you can provide any sort of update of where the Isle of Man is at regarding vaccinations for children. At the moment, it's still being considered um, by the JCVI. The MHRA has actually certified that the vaccine um, can be used for those aged 12 and above, but the JCVI yet has not issued any guidance to roll out. There is a debate, of course, in the scientific community around vaccination of children as to what the, what the actual benefit from it is, if there is a level of benefit that should actually allow for the vaccination, or whether actually it is right to be vaccinating children when there is still elements of the adult population around the world that haven't been vaccinated. So it's quite a wide scientific debate still going on at the moment. But at the moment, there isn't any guidance around actually vaccinating 12 and above. And I'll pass over to the Director of Public Health. Yes, just to add briefly to, to what the Minister's already explained, um, the issue with COVID in children and young people is that they usually are completely asymptomatic or have only very mild disease. So you have to ask in terms of vaccination, what is it you're trying to achieve? You're not really trying to protect children from the risk of severe illness because that risk is vanishingly low. There is an, a known unknown in there around potential for long COVID, but we simply don't know enough to be able to put that into the equation of the balance of risks and benefits. So then you have to turn it round to the other side of things and say, can we justify vaccinating children and young people in order to protect the population as a whole? So that would be the argument about reaching a level of herd immunity. If you're not vaccinating a large chunk of your population, those aged up to 16 to 18, um, then the level of vaccination that you have to achieve in the adults that you are vaccinating has to be very much higher to achieve that herd immunity. So you might be having to look at trying to get above 95% coverage. And that is always going to be a tall order for any vaccination programme. So then you have to say, will the benefits of upping that herd immunity make it worthwhile exposing children to the vaccine for not a very great quantifiable benefit actually for them? And that is a difficult both scientific, medical and ethical issue on top of the issues that the Minister outlined. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And can I thank our media partners for those questions. In closing, just before we finish, I would just like to say I know 
that the changes that we recently did to the borders have made ve very many people exceptionally nervous. It was never going to be easy, this phase. It is undoubtedly the fact that the borders have been one of our greatest weapons throughout this entire pandemic period. And releasing the borders in a slower, a slow and sure manner in order that we can share our beautiful island with many more people was always going to be the toughest task of this pandemic period. People should be assured that we are still doing things in a phased approach, and this is one more step along the way. There is no exact roadmap that we can guarantee. There is no magic way of saying this is the right approach. We have to try things and we have to test things. And I do realise that that will leave many people nervous. But I can assure you we very carefully monitor the situation and we will be continuing to do so as we cautiously start opening our island so that others can enjoy the beautiful island that we have day in, day out. Thank you very much. And if we have anything further to communicate, we will, of course, communicate it at the time. Thank you.